Hey, what's up? Hey. Hey, guys. <clears throat> How are you? Good, good. How are, how's everybody? Good, feeling good. Um, sorry, that was my bad. You couldn't join uh, stage. I just had to oh, allow worries. requests. So it's all good to see you again, Tim. It was fun hanging out with you in, uh, at DEF CON. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. How was the rest of your uh, experience there? It was good. It was a lot of fun. My first DEF CON, a bit of sensory overload, but it was a, it was a blast. Yeah. Yeah, I was exhausted. I got back from Bogota. I slept like 16 hours. Oh, oh my gosh. Same. Yeah, I slept was, like the whole flight back. It was fun, though. It was fun, though. I don't think I saw any of the guild team out there. No. I don't think so. We stayed at home building, but I think like next DEFCON, we are definitely going to be there in good numbers because I there get more. Go. Well, yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be fun. All right, someone has requested to speak, but I'm gonna decline, sorry. All right, guys, uh, let's get started. So yes. this is our weekly community call, uh, if I see that correctly, number 13, which is uh, considered a lucky number by many, I guess. Uh, so great to have you all here. Uh, I see that the audience is still growing. A little bit about our agenda. So first, as usual, uh, Hannah will talk a little bit about the guild updates, what happens on the product side, what happens in the community side. And then we have two delightful guests, Tim from 101 and Colfax from GitPop, uh, both of which uh, we integrated lately, uh, two amazing protocols, and we are going to dive deep into those. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's the 13th community call. And as Bernard said, also like this whole call is about to get the uh, community updated about like our product, like what is happening in the back. So you see like what the guys are uh, working on and also to dive into the integrations in more depth together with our co-hosts. So I just want to say before we get started is if there's any question, you can write in the stage text channel and then we'll answer when we have the AMA time, when we have time for that actually. And before we get started, it's important to state that from now on, our community calls and hangouts are recorded and will be uploaded eventually in our YouTube library. So those who cannot make it to the call can tune in afterwards. So yeah, so if all is clear, shall we start? Let's get started. Awesome. So last week we had another community call and uh, actually a lot has been happening in the back since the last time we had that call. Um, starting the product update part with a really important status on Guild XYZ. So you might knew that, you might realize that, but currently we are experiencing some latencies with the Discord API. So it causes some delays with the role on assignments and assignments, unfortunately, and it's causing some extra troubles for us. And this is what the guys are working on because Discord allows only like 10 role operations every 10 seconds which is not a lot, let's just say that. So in order to avoid being rate limited by Discord, we can't assign roles to many members instantly. And let's just say that like 10 role operations every 10 seconds. And we just got like our, one of our guilds just reached 100K members in their guild. So if we just think about this number and about the number that Discord, Discord allows us, like there's a really big difference. So what's happening in the back? The guild devs are troubleshooting in full force. They are working on different solutions, trying out like to see more and more solution opportunities to get everything back to normal and to make sure that like no guild will experience anything like this in the future. 
And I just wanted to say that in the beginning because it affects all of us. So please help each other by passing this information on to everyone so that all the guild members and guild admins are aware, aware of it and there's nothing to worry about. We have every information that we need on our site. So if anyone, like someone didn't get their role, like nothing to worry about, we still have these. We just cannot assign it immediately. But after a while, those roles and those rewards are rewarded to the yeah. specific members. Well, the main takeaway I think here is that Web2 is limited, Discord is limited, but we are not going to let them. So we are, uh, the de developers are doing some amazing engineering to speed this up, but uh, 100K guild, that's crazy. I, I remember like literally a couple of months ago, we had 100K users in all the guilds combined. So yeah, yeah. basically you guys have been amazing. Growing the community here is crazy. Uh, we are just catching up, but we do our best to catch up and we're going to do that. Yes, indeed, indeed. It was like two months ago, something like this. We were so happy we reached like 100k and now we just have one guild and it, it makes my heart so happy. It's like I'm smiling. It's so nice to know that like you guys are like put your votes on us and you are like here with us. And like regarding this, like this is why even even this is why it's really important to stay these updates. And on our side, like the support team contacted many community admins personally and shared the status updates in different like support channels so to members to avoid panic. So if you even like help us by sharing, like spreading the words, every help is appreciated in the community and apologies like on the side of our team for any inconvenience like no worries we are on it so this is how i wanted to start this to avoid panic nothing to worry about we are doing our best and the guys are doing their best in the back besides this besides this product update uh last week we shared some of our latest features new integrations as setting up Discord role as requirements. And also we had special guests on stage from other space and nukes to dive into these two of our newly added requirement types together. Um, it was fun. We, it was the same Bernat and myself who was co-hosting it and we had Ross with us, if I remember correctly. And just like last time this week, we have some other exciting news integration updates to share with you. Um, this is something that we are sharing just for the core community, like before, like leaking it, because although these things are like live on our platform, on our interface, this is something we, not all of these integrations we announced yet. So this is some leaking, if we can say it like this, but the guys this week, um, since last week shipped Disco, which is like very verifiable credentials and guild now enables cryptographically signed off chain data as requirements so with this code it, it's easy to carry data from web 2 to web 3 under like full ownership and control this is something we announced already you could see it on twitter uh, besides this code there is two more the guys shipped and it's available for you to use as requirement which is orange and rabbit hole but I cannot tell you more on these things because like spicy announcements are coming on Twitter. So stay tuned. Co-hosted events are coming also. We are doing our best on the operation side also. So yeah. from next week. Yeah. One, one more thing I think uh, we can talk about right now is that uh, last week we introduced Discord as a requirement. So basically, if you have already Discord roles set up, uh, then you can use those for guild roles. So uh, it worked the other way around. Previously, you got the guild role, you got the Discord role, you all know that. Now you can reverse it back, which means that if your community is onboarding to guild after already having a uh, sophisticated role set up, we can work with that, we can adapt to it. And kind of an extension to that, which is coming very soon too, is that uh, other, like we are expanding the Discord requirement types uh, with uh, checking if people, uh, if, if a user, if a member has been a Discord user 
before a certain time, which you can specify, or uh, the member has been part of the Discord server before a certain time. So it's, it's great to, uh, on one hand, detect bots who are typically using new account. On the other hand, also to, to recognize and, and see the members who have been supporting your community for a longer time. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for adding this to the product updates. Uh, so basically, yes. And just like last time this week, we have like special guests also on stage we mentioned previously, which is Colfax from Gitpop and Tim from 101. So with, without further ado, I'm giving the stage to you, Bernard, so you can take it from here and we can have a nice interview to dive deep into our integrations together. All right, cool. And welcome back, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. So uh, let's start with uh, Gitpop. Hi, Colfax. Uh, and also, uh, hey, hey. You, you guys can see the Secret Chamber channel uh, where you're going to get the pull up as well at the end of the call. So we are going to share some some links and resources there for you to see uh, about Git pull up and, and 101. So uh, hi, Colfax. Uh, great to have you here. Do you want to start with a little bit of intro uh, about Git pull up and yourself? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Before I jump in, it's awesome to hear all the updates from you guys. Big congrats on <clears throat> the 100,000 member guild. Um, and like those Discord integrations really excite me. And I think it's like cool to see like guild be like a full circle application. So yeah, just really exciting stuff you guys are building. Thanks so much. Um, I guess quick intro about me and Git Poap. Um, uh, my name is Colfax. I'm one of the founders uh, of GitPoApp, and basically, what we what we built with GitPoApp is a platform for recognizing uh, developers and contributors to your projects. So, what we're doing is we have a platform where repo maintainers of open source projects can award PoApps to their contributors uh, to their GitHub repositories. And POAP, for those not familiar, is basically, uh, it stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol. And it's an NFT that you can get awarded for doing a particular action, taking part in like a, in a particular event, or now actually contributing to an open source project. And so sort of the vision for us is it's really like, it's kind of, there's kind of like a missing link around uh, attributing reputation and recognition to people that are contributing to projects and especially doing that in a way that's self-sovereign so that, like it's not tied to a particular platform or application and we find that there's like a lot of really cool things that we can do once we have these tools to like award recognition and uh, to like the contributors then allow them to build reputation and then we can do a lot of interesting things on top of that once we have sort of this on-chain reputation, for example, like a lot of the things now we can do with Guild. So I'm excited to dive into to that stuff with the crew. But yeah, I guess that's a quick high level about uh, GitPop and what we're working on. Thanks so much. So much to dive into here. So maybe I went first with, uh, you are building on top of Poop, if you, as you mentioned. Why did you decide to go that way instead of you, uh, building on top of another protocol, building your own protocol? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, simply the reason why is, so Poap's been around now for a number of years. I think it launched uh, like over three years ago and it's been widely adopted as and accepted as a like an attestation standard, especially in the Ethereum community and now far beyond that. And so instead of trying to sort of bootstrap and like build our own standard, we decided to build on top of Poap to be able to participate in the ecosystem and already give that utility to the people issuing Git apps uh, that already exists in the POAP ecosystem. So like from day one, actually, for Git POAP, uh, all of the Git apps are POAPs. And we have a little bit of extra metadata that we store around the type of contribution that you've done and how much you've contributed. But anything that you can do with a POAP, you can do with a Git POAP. 
And we found a lot of value in, in building on top of POAP exactly for that reason. So Git POAPs have actually been supported on Guild for a while now through the POAP integration. And now like there's this specific Git POAP integration which filters out all the Git POAPs. And that gives like an even like more fine-grained tool to project maintainers um, to do that. So I guess, yeah, that's like the high level and why we built on the POAP uh, protocol is because of the ecosystem and how we can instantly participate and bring value to people based on that. Totally makes sense. I, I like this kind of uh, phenomenon that uh, very successful um, projects like POAP, they actually create their own ecosystem. So uh, they are like uh, small trees and as they are growing up, they, they kind of start new branches, uh, which also live their own life. So that's super cool. Uh, and can you tell me a little bit about uh, why did you choose this angle? Are you yourself a developer? Have you faced this problem that you want to showcase what you did, uh, a different open source project, but there was no good way to do that? Or like how, how, how the Git Pop project itself initiated? Yeah, great question. So I am a developer myself. I've been a software engineer most of my career. I took a brief hiatus from software to actually go cook for a living, but that's like a whole other story. Uh, but most of my career is spent in software development. And uh, over the last couple of years, I've spent time working on open source projects uh, around staking in the Ethereum ecosystem. And I experienced like firsthand challenges around how do you like bootstrap and sustain open source projects? And uh, starting probably about a year and a half ago, I was working on some tools to make it easier for you to run like a validator on Ethereum. And we were building some tools and I wanted some help and I wanted to find a way that I could engage and incentivize contributors to help out with my project, but I didn't have any funding. And so what I started doing was I started actually giving out PO apps manually uh, to anybody who would contribute to my project. And I noticed that like people really enjoyed that and people would contribute and I could give them a POAP. And then they would then have this record of like, oh, I added uh, some or some code to the, the Wagyu Keygen project or whatever. And so that started sort of as the seed trying to solve a problem of growing open source projects for myself. And over the next like six months, uh, just conversations with many different people around what this could add, do to add value for other projects as well as like at scale, what developer recognition on chain looks like and what we can do with that. So it sort of evolved from a little seed to now a full-fledged uh, company. Right on. Uh, so what do you see as the primary use case for Git Co-op right now as it exists with the current kind of environment, the current state of your product? And what's kind of the, the big vision? So how, how are people using Git Co-ops now how are they using them in the future? Yeah, great question. So right now the primary support that we have or the primary product and integration that we have for GitPo app is we work with open source project repo maintainers. And what we do is we help to award a PO app, which we call a GitPo app to anybody who's contributed at least once to their project on a yearly basis. So we call these annual contributor Git POAPs and we integrate directly. It's actually like very lightweight for the repo maintainer. We just work with them to come up with uh, the design. We have a design team that can come up with like a nice POAP design. And since all the code is open source, we can actually do all of the awarding on our end, but we like to partner directly with the repo maintainers to sort of share the vision around how they can use Git Power App and sort of things going forward, which I'll talk about in a second. And then what we do too also is since it's open source and since GitHub has all of the contribution history, what we do is we actually go retroactively issue Git Power Apps back to the beginning of the project. And so for example, like we have awarded Git Power Apps recently for like the hard hat tooling repository. And anybody who contributed going all the way back to the inception of the project gets their Git Pro app and recognition for their contributions. And so that is sort of step number one is this little attestation of whether you contributed or not. And a very common piece of feedback that we've gotten and something that we're working uh, very closely on now is how do you distinguish like how much somebody's contributed? 
Uh, right now, what we're doing as a unit of contribution is a merged pull request, which is very deliberate because uh, if somebody contributes code, sends a pull request, and then if that gets merged, that is implicitly a, a basically saying that that was like a valuable contribution. Something that we're very worried about is like, we want to make sure that people that are actually contributing value to these projects get these Git POAPs. Um, now, in order to delineate like how much somebody's contributed to a project, you could, I guess, look at like number of pull requests, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. Like you could have fixed five typos versus like one pull request is like a gigantic feature. And so the next like big challenge that we're tackling that I think will unlock even further interesting things with integrations like Guild and others is around like how we can better communicate the depth of contribution and how much somebody has contributed to a project. Right. And uh, you mentioned that your metadata is already kind of structured for that to to contain a little bit of a little bit more color on you know how how important how valuable that contribution is, right? Yeah, exactly. I would I would just correct that slightly. I would say our metadata contains information about like the underlying contributions and metrics. So like numbers of uh, pull requests, numbers of lines of code, things like that. But like the assessing how valuable that is is the really challenging part. So right now our metadata does not have any like assessment. Um, but if you take a look at our, our website, if you take a look at anybody's profile, right, github.io, if they have their GitHub account connected, uh, that means that we can publicly associate all their metadata with their Gitpo apps, and you'll see that they have borders around their Gitpo apps. That gives a signal of like how frequently they've contributed to a project. It's like bronze, silver, gold. Oh, that's very smart. I, I, I like how you are kind of visually showcasing that and not just putting a number or putting some text on top of that. Yeah, that's that's very smart. How do you see kind of a model in the future to, you know, kind of contain that 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 detail, that color we are looking for? Like, is it because I assume like you you would want like a certain level of decentralization on that front as well. So are you thinking like attestation from like the repo maintainer and other core contributors or like if if, if you can share anything about that? Yeah, I'll say first thing is this is still very much under development, but I I I think like what we're thinking is like a combination of underlying data as well as like attestations from peers or maintainers is a good approach. Because like raw underlying data doesn't really tell the whole story. And then pure subjectivity also uh, it is very centralized and like doesn't really tell the whole story either. So I think that that's the approach we're going to take. And like our goal is that this data will be useful both for people that are visually looking at somebody's Git POAP collection, but also for integrations like Guild, for example. So we should talk about this as our APIs evolve and we can make sure that Guild is able to fully utilize um all the features around like levels of contribution and things like that going forward right so uh so far we've been talking mostly about open source projects because uh you you get a lot of contributors there reputation matters have you thought about uh using that inside a, a company inside a software company like how would that uh create signals internally like would that be useful is that a use case for you it's a great question. And it's definitely something that's on our mind. Um, there's definitely complexity around like privacy and especially for closed source software, like it's closed source for a reason. And so we're working on working out like sort of like privacy and like sort of sharing uh, permissions on that front. But I definitely do see opportunity in issuing GitPo apps for contributions that happen within companies and private repos. And I'm very particularly excited about the opportunities that lie there because now you can actually have a public attestation of like something that's happening internally within a company and the, the company or like the maintainer can share whatever select information they want about the, the contribution, but not like leak internal data around like specifically what the code is. And right now that's like a challenge on GitHub because on GitHub, you don't really have an opportunity to showcase anything about all the private contributions that you've, that you've made. So that's that's something that we're going to be working on uh, pretty soon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I can see that's a big challenge. Uh, what's the best way to get involved with Git Pop? Like, if if someone listens here, like they are very much inspired. Like, where should they start? Uh, understanding the contracts, start 
contributing to other code bases to earn GitHub, start contributing to you? Is there any possibility along these lines? Yeah, great question. So I would say the, the best source of information for all things GitHub is our Twitter. Uh, it's at GitHub, G-I-T-P-O-A-P. Um, and what we announced, there are a couple different things like around how to contribute, et cetera. A few things coming up. So we do have some components of our system open source that people have, you can contribute to. We have a couple of initiatives that we're going to actually announce pretty soon around uh, projects for GitPop that we want to crowdsource. And of course, we'll award GitPops for. Um, another thing that we do is we have a regular community call as well. We're currently hosting it monthly, but we're likely to increase the, uh, the cadence of them soon. And we use this community call as a way to showcase open source projects that are awarding Git apps that are looking for contributors and a place for contributors to come to learn about how they can get more involved in the Web3 ecosystem. So our next community call is actually next week, a week from today at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And so if anybody's interested in getting involved in the Web3 ecosystem as a developer, even like documentation um, or just getting involved in like open source, I definitely recommend coming to that call. We're going to be hosting uh, Alex Stokes from the EF, who's working on a project called MEVRS. And so I would say that's the best thing. Definitely come to our community call next week and then follow along on Twitter for other announcements around initiatives and things that, uh, that we want to get more developers involved in. Amazing. Thanks so much. Uh, very much looking out for it. And uh, thanks for the cooperation, like throughout these past weeks and months uh, where we got to know each other, like you've been an amazing partner and very much looking forward to like tie the Gitpo family and the Gears family closer together. So thanks so much. Thank you so much too. It's been a lot of fun working with uh, everybody in the Guild team and excited to continue it. Great. Uh, now on to somewhat similar, but also very different voters. Welcome team from 101. Uh, we are going to talk about education and Web3. Hey, hey, yeah, excited to talk. And um, well, fact, it's, it's always good to hear some of the stuff you guys are doing. I'm super excited to see it. I'll, uh, I'm going to be there on that community call. Nice. Well, thanks. Uh, just a friendly reminder, next time, don't do a community call at the same time as the guild one. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same overlap, but uh, just kind of trying to calculate uh, the time slots here. I'll make sure right now, I don't think, right now it's 1 p.m. local time for me. I'll make sure that it's not conflicting. Oh, well, I, thought so... it, I thought it was 11, sorry, but I was just joking, yeah. All good. If it's a conflict, I'll make sure we never do it again. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, because, don't cross us. Yeah, because I want to be there, but I have to be here, and I want to be here as well. Anyway, now, uh, Tim, welcome. Uh, do you want to say a few words about yourself, 101, and kind of how you how you came to the inception of 101? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm Tim. I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of, of 101. And uh, what we're building is kind of like Substack for learning powered by Web3. Um, I'll uh, kind of back into that description now. Uh, basically, we recognize that uh, Web3 really changes the game for learning, specifically the ability to incentivize learning, issue irrefutable reputation to your students effortlessly, and um, build a community around your learners. All of these things are uh, net new and super powerful with Web3 architecture. Um, and so when we were um, kind of like putting our plans together in January of this year, which is when we started, we, um, we realized, we were just realized there was a massive opportunity that no one was looking at. And so um, we jumped into the space to solve for it. Uh, with the idea that this is like what the future of education looks like, you know, putting aside our company, we think the future of ed education is distributed, it's community based, and being able to give everyone access to these tooling is how we kind of usher in a more meritocratic uh, future of education where everyone has access. And so that was really exciting to us. And the opportunity was right there for the taking. So my co-founder and I jumped in in January. We put out an MVP in March, 
And we've just crossed a quarter million credentials issued on 101. Uh, something like 200 different orgs have made content on our site. Uh, 150 or 60,000 unique uh, people or unique wallets hold a 101 badge. Um, but we're just getting started. Everything's been in the context of these micro courses. So if you go to 101.xyz, you'll see a bunch of micro learning experiences that are just five minutes, 10 minutes. That's what we've been focused on for now. Um, but there's a lot more to come. Uh, but I'll kind of bite my uh, tongue for now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the learning opportunity and kind of uh, tackling education in Web3 is super obvious. Like, I, I can relate to it because I have many friends in the space. And we've been talking, uh, who I've been talking to about, you know, kind of our own journeys into the space. And we went through like very similar steps and we can relate to each other. So like a way to kind of showcase that, that I've been there, done that, I I, I kind of got through the steps. So I, I find it, it's it's very similar along the lines of, of GitPop as well, because you actually get a digital asset for something you've done, for something, you know, you push yourself forward, you push the community forward, and, and instead of just, you know, spending money on, on, on a PFP or something like that. So to me, like these kind of NFTs are much, much more relatable. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, definitely. Right. Uh, Want to say a few words about... Uh, whoa, and, and whoa, like... whoa. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's just for me, but um, can you... Try saying that again. It was uh... okay. Uh, Han Hannah, can you hear me? Help yeah, me out here. Yes, yes, yes. It's all good. Okay. Uh, can you hear us? Wow, also? something is breaking about my uh, audio right now. Voice sounds distorted. That is not good. You wanna like? um wow disconnect and connect back again or something like this or maybe may, maybe try to connect from oh, another yeah. device okay i, I think, think he, i think he's gonna like do that and connect from his phone or something like this yeah so yeah this it, is a this is a prime example of why you should do async learning and not sync <laughs> learning because i i <laughs> Like during COVID, all the students throughout like kind of the world had to do online education and, and I heard there were many issues in many countries, many regions, similar problems and, you know, team and 101 are here to solve it. Oh yeah, exactly. absolutely. It's funny how far we've come technologically in so many ways, but a simple video, like synchronous remote, like video call, still has so many challenges. Oh yeah. That's, that's my pet peeve that like these simplest things never work. Like, you know, another one is Wi-Fi. It's always like you go to a new place, connecting to, to Wi-Fi is still like a hassle. Another one is printers. Like I, it's, it's so funny that like, if you want to use a printer you've never used before, it's, it's literally a huge challenge you need to solve. Like, how do you connect to that? So, yeah. Yeah, Terrible. I, actually, it, ha it happened to me yesterday, even yesterday in the office, I wanted to use the printer and I asked someone else like, hey, you are already connected to it. Like, I'm afraid of it. So I can agree. <laughs> right. I'm back. I'm back. I think it was a discord problem. It sounded like you were demons. I could barely tell what you were saying. <laughs> but we're good now. Okay, great to have you back. Uh, and sorry, we've shown our true colors to you. Uh, but <laughs> I know your secret now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe like uh, we, we are probably gonna experiment with uh, you know a few different avenues for hosting this course. But right now, this course seems convenient enough. Uh, oh. Right. So where were we? Yeah, uh, I was just gonna ask that. Uh, so right now you are doing micro courses and like, is there kind of uh, an approach to like how to scale that up? go to like more in-depth content, go to uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'm just going to leave the question very much open-ended, like as much as you want to share about your future plans. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the softball. I know you're, uh, I know you're, you've seen some of our updates. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we, uh, we, 
We actually, um, I'll, I'll share some alpha on this call. This is not something that we're uh, putting out publicly yet um, because it's just like not ready to be rolled out today on the platform. But, but we're actually changing our positioning a little bit. At the beginning of this call, I mentioned that we were trying to build the sub stack for learning, give everyone their own ability to launch a learning community with our tools, their own branded learning community. Um, that's not kind of tied up in the 101 branding and marketplace. Uh, so that is a change in positioning where all of the creator pages on 101 will become their own subdomains. So if you want to have, you know, uh, your own kind of like uh, web 3.101.xyz or, you know, intro to you know, whatever your project name is, .101.xyz with your own logo and your own community can live there um, in terms of the content. Uh, that's what uh, we're rolling out soon. In addition to that, uh, sooner than that, is the a longer form format. So the ability to have a video series and long form markdown that is on a widescreen modal instead of the short micro format that we're using now, that's going to come uh, in the next week or two. Um, and that'll like really help for communities that have done a great job at using our tool for gathering attention and spreading like surface level awareness, but now want to pull users further down that user education funnel. So that's what we're catering to next. I love that. It totally makes sense to kind of first address the surface level and then, then bring them deep down in your chambers of knowledge. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, this is what we are, we are kind of uh, trying to orchestrate here in our own communities and trying to have other communities to do with Guild as well. Like how do you create kind of the onboarding uh, and learning and kind of activity funnel from some, for someone who just hears about your community, maybe a little bit intrigued, maybe follows you on Twitter to actually become like a power user, a core contributor, and a very much involved part of your community. And I think there are like so many, so many phases of this. And, and different journeys, whether someone wants to, uh, wants to develop and, and, and get gift co-ops, wants to accumulate knowledge or, you know, anything mm -hmm. between and beyond. But uh, the community building to me is always about uh, kind of getting uh, wider and wider, which means distribution, uh, get the word out there that we are here, we are doing something valuable but also about depth. And that's probably even more important to, if someone finds you, like how are you helping them to, to get to know you, to get involved? And I mean, this is why we are doing these community calls as well. This is why, you know, all these projects are doing these amazing community calls. Yeah, um, like it's, it's about how can we get the right people in front of the right information and the right people at the right time. And that, that is the general uh, mandate of any learning product, in our opinion. So it's certainly something we think about on a high level. And I, I hope that uh, everyone here will agree when we launch these new features, which we're internally calling V2 because it just looks completely different than what we have today. I hope everyone will agree that we've completely rethought what a course even means and what a learning product can can be uh, some of the, yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm just excited for, for you guys all to check it out. We, we don't really subscribe to the, par the kind of like old paradigm of, of what. A uh, so just like kind of like sharing what, what we're, Building, uh, this will probably come out Q1, but uh, we believe that like the, the kind of like old idea of what a course is where you must start at point A and you must end at point Z is uh, really exclusionary in the sense that if you don't need to start at A, you're very unlikely to do the course at all. Even if you don't know anything from C to Z, if you already know A, the course itself is like unattractive to you in the old paradigm. And so we want to remove this like gate at the start of every course where it's like this big button to start the course. Instead, we want to make sure that uh, a course is just kind of like a loose collection of information in a series together. And all of the uh, lessons within that course in the middle are serviceable 
at the root level, meaning like when you're searching for a piece of information on a site, you're seeing all of the information relevant to your search, even if it's in the middle of a course. And you jump in to that with a, you know, you have this pre-existing intent, you search for it, you end up reading through it. And only then by accident do you realize, oh shit, I'm accidentally taking a course or like, oh, there's actually a series here and I can go to the next one or I can go backwards. Um, and each lesson itself will issue a, like one of these badges in addition to kind of a meta badge for the whole course. And so in this way, we're still able to credential people based on the like small atomic units of a course, but uh, we don't force people to, yeah, and we don't force people to take the entire thing if it's not relevant to them. So that's like one of the things that we're thinking about. And the other is this idea of, of content creation. If we're building a truly Web3 native tool, then we should have a composable library that the entire world can share. Even though everyone has their own branded subdomain or maybe it's just like a custom domain completely, that doesn't mean we can't collaborate on content together. Uh, and it turns out that when projects are you know, trying to create educational material, the best material tends to come from outside the walls of the company. Just independent educators that are passionate about teaching, making uh, material about a given project. Uh, and so we think in order to really recognize that and leverage that organic behavior, we should have a licensing feature built into the product where you know maybe Superfluid notices that someone in the external community has made a really amazing Superfluid tutorial for their own audience, and they want to license that and bring it under the official super fluid academy on 101 that would be just a matter of you know a few clicks inside the interface where the educator can accept the request and if there's any sort of payment that payment is split automatically with the original creator and i think this points to how uh the education world will end up shaking out over the next decade where individual educators kind of specialize and the communities themselves serve more of the role of a curator of that material than the originator of it. Uh, so those are some of the ideas that we're pretty excited about building into the product next year. I really, really like it. Uh, we are actually in the process of establishing a more structured knowledge base uh, for everything related to GEO that's kind of the product grows and there are more and more features. It's, it's been imminent to kind of step up our game in that regard. And uh, actually, like you are hitting a lot of strings, we've been thinking about, uh, especially like how to make sure that people get in front of the content that they really need, instead of like forcing them to go through uh, a series, uh, a part of which maybe is already known to them or not relevant to them. So yeah, definitely gonna hit you up and, and kind of ask for advice there. Uh, great. Uh, Another question I had to you is, uh, do you want to just very briefly share a little bit about uh, the badges themselves, just to get a little bit technical? So I know they are non-transferable, you know, just a few of the choices you made there and why you why you made them. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we uh, 101 badges are soul bound NFTs. And um, the reason why, and they're on our own contracts. And for each blockchain network, there's one contract that mints the badges that uh, we uh, deployed ourselves. The reason we chose this is because uh, we we wanted maxima maximal uh, like customizability over the way that the credentials operate. And um, we because like when we launched our company, right, we were just like a very basic premise that this kind of functionality would be useful, but we're not really sure what the overarching like thesis of this company is yet or what people will want to use it for. And so maintaining optionality and how the credentials operate uh, was super, super important to us. Um, also, like we we felt that uh, having them be non-transferable uh, would be a really good way to just like have the existence of a badge in a wallet convey the most amount of information as possible. Like the sheer fact that it exists uh, in someone's wallet says a lot. And um, that's only possible because it's our own contract and they're non-transferable. Uh, our own contracts means that anyone that has a badge 
must have signed an assessment on 101 with their wallet and gotten it correct. And so there's no other way to end up with a credential on 101. And because they're non-transferable, that's like, that's certainly true. So there's no uh, secondary kind of like layer of logic that every front end has to build in to say, oh, you know, was this transferred or, um, you know, was this issued by someone else? Uh, the other reason why it was helpful to have somewhat a centralized contract issuer is that uh, the integrations are just easier, honestly. Uh, we're not like the ecosystem of, of Web3 is not super mature. <clears throat> um, yet. <laughs> uh, so when you're building out ecosystem, like when you're building out integrations, at least in our experience, they tend to like, there's not tons of like middleware that makes aggregating NFT collections across multiple contracts and across multiple blockchains really easy. Instead, it tends to be what's your contract address. And this is going here in our interface. Um, and if you have, you know, if every creator had their own contract address, for instance, which is something we thought about, that would make aggregating all your one-on-one one badges just that much more difficult. And again, the priority was for them to mean as much as possible right out the gate and for them to be maximally um, kind of like interoperable and allow other people to build on top of it as much as we could right out the gate as well. That being said, we do give the creators the ability to choose the network. So most of our credentials are in Polygon, but we also have a cello and we will add a bunch of other chains because the, um, the balance we're trying to strike is although we want to make sure that we can kind of be a steward for this credentialing ecosystem, we also want to make sure that we're giving optionality to the creators themselves and that we are ultimately serving those creators as a tool for them to decide how they want these to shake out. So we may actually introduce verifiable credentials. Um, we don't want to really decide how credentials like this ought to be represented. We'd rather just kind of give the tools over to the creator and each of them can say, hey, I want to do mine as Polygon. I want to do mine as Cell. I want to do mine off-chain as VCs. Um, that's a, a very reasonable future to us. All right. Totally makes sense. Thanks for the thorough explanation. Just as a very last question, uh, we, we had a question from the community which is, uh, does non-transferable token mean that I could be spammed with a credential that I can get rid of? So is it like, uh, but, but I guess like you already answered that question, uh, which is no, because you actually need to connect your wallet and claim it yourself. Is that right? Uh, yeah, like not generally speaking, you can get spammed with people's non-transferable badges. Right. For, for 101, you have to take a course to get it. And I don't think we have it in the site today, but um, we have a PR for burning your badges. If you want to just send them to a burn address, uh, we're going to put that out there too. Okay. Like if I'm not proud anymore that I, I learned something new. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, if, if that's, if that, if, if you're in the audience and you are want to burn your one one badge, I would like to know why. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then very, very final question. How can we get involved? Like where should we start getting involved with 101? Yeah. So, uh, we haven't really done much by way of like formal community building yet, but as you know, I, uh, just started a, uh, telegram chat. So, um, but it's, it's meant to be for people that are like actively using the product and thinking about what they want to see from it next. So, if you are in this audience and you use 101 a lot, uh, message me either here on Discord or on Twitter, and, and I will invite you to join the Telegram group. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at 101DOTXYZ, or just go to uh, the link 101.xyz, scroll to the bottom, and there's our, uh, our Twitter icon is on our website. All right, perfect. Thanks so much, team. And... Uh... Huh. Uh, for, for the Guild community, one last thing, which we just announced today, but I want to draw a little bit of attention to it. I just posted the link in the Event Treats uh, channel, which is, to, to me, or in my opinion, it's a huge, huge thing. So basically, uh, what we just did here and what will be out uh, quite soon is a collaboration with ePass, which enables you 
to redeem any gear draw to your Apple wallet or Google wallet. Basically, you no longer have to, uh, with this, you no longer have to uh, actually bring your Web3 wallet to you to in real life events. You can just generate this QR code and prove that you have that role in the guild, which is dependent on you having a certain asset or fulfilling a requirement in some other way, and basically use it very, very elegantly, just like you would with, a, with an airplane ticket or anything else. So guild is coming to a non-Web3 wallet near you very, very soon. All right, and that was our final plug for the day.